Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, Tagask Equine Breeding Conference on Breeding and Producing the Modern Show Jumper. My topic is factors impacting financial success, and I suppose there's various different levels of success if you, outside of financial, where as a breeder, you might term, deem success where you take a mare, you cover her, you have a live foal, you nurse that, whole, that foal to health, uh, let's say, um, to the sales, you sell it on, and the ultimate success would be it goes on and competes on the international stage. And, and the ultimate success really would be that we compete for Ireland and, and achieve great success uh, for the Irish sport horse. But I want to zone in on the financial end of it. And let's say, I suppose, looking at uh, what we as breeders need to consider with regards uh, the marketplace, what the market requirements are, and what the costs are involved in that, and looking at some insights to what the marketplace is saying regarding the, the price that's achievable for horses for sale. So I suppose the first thing we've got to look at is, if you look at the options of the breeder, what are, what are your options if you go to breed? Well, one, you breed uh, and you sell as foals, and in that sector, from your benefit, or from your point of view rather, there's very little... Um, it's a shorter time frame, you don't have much, as many much facilities, you don't have, have to have a whole lot of training skills, but it's a case of trying to isolate that market and being able to sell at that market as a foal. Your second option is breeding and selling young horse at three years of age. Obviously, there's more time involved. Now your horse has to pass vetting if it goes to the sales. Um, it's obviously you've got a greater risk of, of injury happening to that horse over that period of time. And also you have to have the skills or else you're going to have to pay for somebody to, to train your horse to present it at time of sale. So that's extra expense. Uh, and finally then, let's say we just decide I'm going to take this horse and I'm going to produce it under saddle in competitions. And for majority of breeders, that's very expensive. And I suppose today we'll be discussing alternatives. If, if you have a horse that you feel has the potential to go on, what other avenues can you do with that horse to achieve financial success and get it to achieve its, its true talent also? I want to discuss a little bit about hobby versus commercial. Because I suppose we think of breeding, there are a lot of hobby breeders in the country. Some of you here today might consider yourselves hobby breeders. And there's others who are dealing commercial where they are attaining their full-time livelihood from breeding uh, and selling sport horses. And if you look up the definition of a hobby in the dictionary, it's an activity or interest pursued for pleasure or relaxation and not as a main occupation. And a lot of breeders fall into that where they may have one or two mares, they have other income coming into the household, and they're looking at this as a supplementary entry income. But I suppose like any hobby, the more enjoyment you get out of it is if there's an element of success. Now, I don't play golf, but I, I believe the, the, the bug with golf is when you hit that perfect shot and you go, that's worth all the, the mornings out in the greens uh, and the bad weather and etc. And if you look at breeding, what's the ultimate financial success? When you take that, whether it be a four or three-year-old to the sale, that somebody is willing to give you money that you can leave some in your pocket for your endeavours. That is success. And that is, there's a great sense of satisfaction in that, that you have produced, whether it be privately or to the auction, an animal that the market wants and is willing to pay for. And unfortunately, the flip side of that is if you go and nobody wants that horse, or not willing to pay you any money, that is a, a side that unfortunately um, you may have to bear, and we have to discuss how to move away from that where you generate a market for the product. And commercial able to yield and make a profit where you're very aware of the market needs and you're doing your best to aim and produce for that market. So in both camps, you, to be financially successful, you must have a plan. You must know what your end user wants. You must understand the marketplace and you must keep up to date because it's all the time changing. And therefore, uh, that requires time and requires effort. So breaking that up, I want to talk about marketing and the four P's of marketing. If you look Product, place, price, promotion. And if you look at this diagram here, the target market. So in this case, we're all here today to discuss the target market of show jumping. What does the show jumping market require? Well, it wants a product, as in an animal, to compete at the top level. And the place that is going to be true is to the competition, um, to the marketplace at international level. The promotion of that product will be to the results, and that will influence price. So all these four areas are incontric are, are, are very closely interlinked, and all the time you must focus on what that target market requires. And if you're looking at breeding the show jumper, in order to be financial, you need to be aiming at the top, and what are the demands of that top market? And you may not succeed, but if you filter down, hopefully you're still in the realms of achieving a uh, financial return. So with that in mind, we've got to discuss, okay, well, what is the top product, the top market?
Okay, so obviously we're, we're very much aiming there for the top end of the market. And if you think of breeding, and, and we think of the pyramid system, by its very nature, when you aim up the top 160, why is that at the apex of your, of your, of your pyramid? Because those horses are very difficult to breed. They're very difficult to come by. But that is a very lucrative market if you're lucky enough to breed something for that market. And that's the ultimate goal, but that is lucrative. Whereas you filter down your, your pyramid, yes, you're lucrative down, I suppose, the 130 bracket, but here becomes uh, a little bit more difficult, simply because the pyramid is expanding. Yes, there's a, a, a greater supply for horses at that level, but also there's a much bigger supply of horses in that. So at present, let's say there are challenging times as we're all very much acutely aware of the economic downturn. There's not the same amount of disposable income. So this market particularly is suffering because the demand does not match supply. Supply overweighs demand. And as a result, this market here is suffering because of the amount of competition of horses and the marketplace is dictating the price. So as breeders, we have to understand if we're breeding and our horses are aiming at this level, achieving financial t return will be very difficult. Unless, obviously you have the exceptions, but on the average, it's very difficult to get financial return here. Whereas we move up the ladder and you're aiming at the top and you're filtering down, you have the opportunity to get financial return. So if you think about the clip, that's the top end. I've shown you international level, jumping one meter 60. As a breeder, Taking that, what product, what, what do I have to do to achieve that product or make that product? Well, I have to have, first of all, my mare is the key. And the mare will be just in detail throughout the day. But what she brings to the table, the attribute she brings to the table, her pedigree, is it performance orientated? Has she performed herself? And th that is an area where it's difficult for breeders, but certainly because of the financial um, cost of, 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 of putting the mare out in, in competitions, but also, let's say, they should be evaluating the mares at young horses, particularly three fours of age, and the, the horse and mare inspections are uh, an opportunity to get an independent appraisal of mares if you haven't got the skills uh, yourself. Looking at the dam line of the mare, is it performance rich? Does she come from a family that have bred performers that are competing at, 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 at international level, one meter 40 and above? Is she herself an athletic, athletic model? Does she bring the attributes of, um, to the table that she can pass on those traits to her offspring. And if you have that mare, then you've got to take great care in, in selecting your sire. And obviously the, the, the ultimate would be to select a sire as a, a producer of performance horses, but you may choose a, a, a young sire, and therefore you're very much going on his performance, but he needs to be a performer. So breaking that down, the show jumper, what does that bring to the table? It has to be athletic, it has to have blood, as in being as responsive. Um, when you think about show jumping now, it's not only a case of jumping the fences and leaving the standee, they have to go against the clock and they have to be quick on the ground in order to be in the placings. They have to have ample scope, they have to be careful, and they have to have good technique. Show jumping as a sport has greatly changed. The fences now, um, the height hasn't really changed, but the poles are much lighter, the cups are more shallower, and therefore the horse has to be ultra careful to compete at the top level. So with an understanding of what the market is and the target market is and what the product they're looking for, you move on and, well, price, what, what's, the, what, what, what's the market going to pay me for me going to this trouble? I suppose, first of all, you've got to ask, well, what are the costs involved? What's it going to cost me to produce this animal with, and then looking to the market, am I going to get financial return for that? And also looking at your competitors, what are they achieving? And it's difficult in this regard because, let's say, um, our director, Jerry, mentioned uh, the UCD economic report that was published last year. And there was a survey done on, let's say, the industry in regards to the private sales. And it's very difficult to get, you know, real tangible data regarding the private sales. But that report came back with that 73% of animals are sold privately and 27% are sold in the marketplace. And the average price for the horses sold privately was about 4,700. And that included foals, three-year-olds, older horses. So, to look at the private market, it's very difficult to get uh, meaningful data that I can share with you today, but the, the, the auction houses, we can. And we can look at, okay, what are the averages, returns for foals, three-year-olds, and older horses through the sales, and what are their average returns for the top end of that market? And they do tell a story. So look at the cost of production. Okay, how long is a piece of string? Because each of you have your own individual scenario at home, where you maybe have 
a lot of land where the horses live out for long periods of the winter. You might have um, you might have a mare that goes on foal very easily. Uh, your veterinary cost, if you're if you're bringing in semen, obviously your veterinary cost will be much more. Um, so what I've done here, I'm not taking into consideration uh, labour costs or land land costs or mare depreciation. I'm looking at the cash costs. And I haven't included here the stud fee because it can range from 200 to 2,500. What I want to get you to focus on, what are my cash costs in producing a foal to wheeling, to time of sale? So we go down through and we go to the keeper stud, the farrier, dosing, dentist, etc. We come to a total of 1,197 for the foal to be born. And that's not including the stud fee. And if we take into consideration the cost of production for the foal, and again, go to the farrier dosing uh, registration, entry fee to the sales, we're looking at a cost of 454 euros. So when we add the two together, and again, I'm looking at the cash cost, not including the stud fee, not including your labour, we're coming to a, f a figure of 1,651 euros. So before you go selecting your sire, <coughs> excuse me, and go to the marketplace, you need to be aware that this is not including stud fee, and this is the minimum, obviously, plus whatever your stud fee may be, and this is not factoring in where you've uh, injuries, you've extra veterinary costs, etc., to your, to your animal. So as I mentioned with the marketplace, you look at the private sales, and the UCD report, as I mentioned, 73% of the household privately, and the average price was 4,755. And that's based on all age brackets. The auction houses, if you look at the sport house performance sales, I'm looking at Goldsbridge and Cavan. I'm not looking at the Irish draft results or the Connemara. And I've got analysis over the past five years. So when we go to the marketplace for foals, you notice the average has pretty much been consistent, but there's a big jump in 2013. And this is both for the average return and the top 20%. The bottom 10%, I'm not going to dwell on it. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. If you're in that division, you are losing a lot of money and harsh decisions have to be made whether you continue with your breeding program. Why is the average such a difference? There's two reasons. One, the amount of horses or foals that sold this year are marginally down. And two, the success of the elite sales. And the elite sales I'm talking about are the, the elite sale foal auction that took place um, after the Breeders Classic in Barna Down and at Cavan Equestrian Centre as part of the, the national show. And what happened in those two cases? The organisers brought the breeder and the sport together. As a result, there was a marketplace where some of those buyers may not have been at the uh, sales, full sales if they'd not been at that environment. And secondly, the marketplace brought a product to those sales that the market wanted to pay money for because it was showing potential to fulfill the need of that end market. So people were willing to spend money. So the elite sales are working. And I think that was a fantastic initiative where you brought the breeder and the sport together. However, if we take out the elite sales, what is the average return? It's 1,577. It's very similar to, to last year. Again, highlighting the significance of the elite sales. If we take the average top 20% without the elite sales, again, we're at 3,941. Uh, 2,000 of a different, just highlighting the level of, of, of money that was spent on the top folds. Average of elite sales in total was 5,239, and the top 10% average was 7,750. So we move and we decide now to take away our estimated costs, well, again, which are cash costs, and we haven't included the stud fee yet. Average returns without the elite, we're in negative equity, we're 74 euros down, and we have yet to include the stud fee. If you go to the average returns with the elite, we have 591 euros, and if our stand is 591.50, we're in trouble. Okay? So therefore, your, your, your stud fee is not going to cover in this price. The top 20%, 5,586. We have 3,935 in profit. If we take our stud fee at 1,200 euros, which looking to the, 
the, the, the sales and taking into consideration the standing fees for the elite sales, the average is in the region of 12 to 1500. If we take another 500 into place, if you're shipping in semen and courier costs, we are still in profit with that return. And this, folks, is the market as breeders we need to be aiming. And again, yes, it's only a small portion of the market, the market as in the, the auction houses, the private industry is much greater, but as breeders, if you're looking at to get tangible results, there is a marketplace and is willing to pay for the correct model that's fit for purpose. If we look at the cost of production for a three-year-old, and again, I'm taking, let's say, each scenario is, um, is, is difficult, uh, sorry, in, sorry, each scenario is different, and we look at the cost of production. I've based this on a 16-week period where you've housed the animal. Many of you might have enough land where you can house them outside, um, but let's say as cash costs, we're coming up with a figure of 1,000, 789 to produce it to three year old. And that's not taking into consideration uh, if there's any injuries or um, it has to be going to the vet in the meantime. It's just basically looking after the welfare of the horse, regular dosing, regular attention by the farrier, vaccines, uh, etc. So, what is the cost of producing our three year old? When you combine both figures of 1,651 and the 1,789, our total estimated cash cost is 3,440 euros and we still haven't included the stud fee. And these are, I suppose, this is reality in so far as what costs are. We could argue they could be up or down, some might be more expensive, some a bit less, but I think as a foundation, we have to be mindful <coughs> that it's gonna be in a region on this reason. And what is the marketplace saying in relation to what it's willing to pay? Again, if you look at the average for three-year-olds, a trend that's been similar up to 2013, and again, that's increased, uh, slightly as a result of the elite sales, and I've counted in the go for gold and the uh, monarch sales in these results. The top 20% again is an increase. But auto straight away, when you look at the average return for the three year old market at 3,031, we're at a loss straight away, and we haven't included the stud fee. And the marketplace is saying, yes, if you breed these horses, yes, you may get return, but no, we are not willing to pay you to cover your costs for that type of animal. This is the animal we want you out, and we are willing to pay for that, that animal. So looking, if you take, again, subtracting your costs from your returns, take the average return without the elite sales, we're 980 euros in debt, and we haven't accounted for the stud fee. We're uh, 409 euros in debt with the elite included, but we are 4,017 in profit, and we take the stud fee out of that. And again, if you're allowing, as I mentioned earlier, if you're 12 to 1,500 stud fee, and you've extra veterinary costs possibly in that as well, you are still in profit. Or you have the chance of success of being in profit. The marketplace for four-year-olds and five-year-olds, I'm not gonna dwell on this, uh, for too long, but I just want to highlight the trends. Again, um, it's margin up in last year, but if you look at the average return for a four-year-old, it's lower than the average return for a three-year-old. So as breeders, we have to be mindful if we have to keep these horses on and break them. The added cost of that, if you yourself can ride or break the horse, that reduces the cost, but if you have to send that horse away to get trained, that adds to the cost significantly. And if you look at the average return, it's significantly lower than the um, average return on three-year-olds. And the same would be likewise for the top 20% of four-year-olds. So the, the marketplace with regards to four and five-year-olds um, is not as lucrative. Um, obviously, you've got, you've got the, the individual high prices, but overall, if you look at, and you as a breeder have to look at the overall to get an average. Yes, you can look at the, the high results and go, yes, that's where I want to be. But you have to be practical. And the practicality is looking at what the average returns are and looking at this is where you want to be, that top 20%, because there's your, your chances of having financial return. So if we look at the averages overall, the average returns for foals, three-year-olds, four- and five-year-olds from 2000 to 2013. As we've discussed, you can see the average has increased uh, greatly for the foals, and I think this, yes, the full, uh, amount of foals sold has decreased slightly, but the success of the elite foal sales has been a huge contributor to that spike. The three-year-olds, again, slightly up, and I suppose you could argue, or 
the three, four, and five-year-olds, yes, the, the, the lot sold are slightly down, but the elite sales have had a, a, a very positive impact on that, and that's including Monarch and, and the Go for Gold. Foles top 20%. Again, in this realm, you can look at Foles. Uh, we're up at 7,000 euros nearly. Three-year-olds, just a little over 7,000. Four-year-olds, uh, slightly uh, about 6.7, and five-year-olds were up at 6.2. So as a breeder and looking for the ultimate financial return, selling as foals appears at present to be a, a good area. Three-year-olds, um, yes, you're up at a higher price, but the profit margin uh, in the difference is just a little over 1,000. And secondly, you've had to keep the horse for an extra two years, three years, I beg your pardon, and whatever level of training goes into that as well. Top 10%, look at foals. Again, this is the ultimate where you're in the top bracket. We're up at nearly 8,000 for foals uh, return, 10,000 for three-year-olds, 9,000 for four-year-olds, and just a little over 8,000 for, for five-year-olds. And there's, a, as you can see, a significant spike in the four- and five-year-old bracket. And again, I would contribute that to the elite sales. So the marketplace, conclusions. The marketplace is very selective. And again, I, I want to stress that it's, it's only a portion of the industry, as I mentioned in the, the report which was carried out by UCD, 27% of animals go through the auction houses, 73 go through private sales. The, the data from the private sales, we have no, I suppose, tangible data to give you what prices people are achieving. So therefore, as breeders, we must take stock of, of the, the, the auction house and what that's telling us. And I think what's coming l true loud and clear is there's a market for the well-bred animal that's the potential to compete at the higher market. And the marketplace is willing to financially pay you for your troubles. It's not, it'll get you out at the lower end, the middle market, but leaving you profit, unfortunately, uh, the sign or the, the, the result of the data is saying, no, you will not come out uh, with financial profit or with profit. Other factors to consider, and I suppose as breeders, we have to, you're going to enter a breeding program, and this will be discussed quite a lot today. Let's say you, you decide, I'm going to um, make a decision, I'm not going to continue with this mare, I'm going to get another mare to breed from, I'm going to go out and seek bloodlines, she's performance ideally, but certainly there's, 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 there's show jumping performance uh, in her dam line, and she's a performer herself, and I'm going to suit, uh, select a suitable sire. Then you go to time of sale. The success of your breeding program, a lot of that depends on who buys your horse, or your foal, or your three-year-old. Because if that falls into the right hands, the chances of your horse achieving its true potential is far greater. Whereas if it falls into hands that um, the horse um, isn't, I suppose, it doesn't achieve its true potential, or the person has no ambition to, to compete on the higher one meter forty or above, that is lost to your breeding program. Whereas if one of your young horses, this is something a breeder has to discuss as well, whether you consider giving one of your young horses to a rider to produce and you do a deal, that you get up the rankings to put mileage on it with a view that you maybe as a mayor take in rails from her or you sell her on, but it's helping the project that's coming through from behind because that horse, if it's, got, if it's successful on the national and international stage, will add tremendous value to the project that's coming through. And this is breeders where you've got to be mindful of, do you know, the short-term gain may not be serving your long-term financial goals. Also, we've got to be mindful as breeders, have we got the necessary skills to produce our young horses? Are we asking too much of them too young, where again, they may not be achieving their true potential on account of being overproduced at a young age and, over and, and rushed in their training? Costs, We've, I've gone through, I suppose, the cash costs. I suppose costs are a big factor, and obviously there's ways of reducing those costs and being more cost-effective. Um, Director, Jerry Boyle mentioned earlier about the benefits of the discussion group model and how successful that has been in the dairy and beef sectors. I think the discussion group model, and there's some members here from the Waterford uh, Breeders Discussion Group, and I think there's some members from the West Mayo as well here today. As a group, they've been very successful because group means buying power. You can buy in bulk, and as a group, you can get discounts. As a group, you can work together with the promotion of your stock. There's a sharing of knowledge. And when you bring a group of people together on a day like this, there's such a wealth of knowledge within the room. And when you share that knowledge, it's benefiting everybody. 
And everybody has something to share with their experience with the horses, etc. And to move forward and to get into where we're breeding horses that the international market is seeking for in Ireland, I think we very much need to uh, cons consider the discussion model and discuss and, and consider working more closely together. And doing so will lift the whole, the whole industry. I've discussed in detail the marketplace, the target market, the product it requires, the price it's willing to pay, uh, and the, the level of competition it's got to compete at. I want to discuss about promotion. The easiest way to promote your horse is having a story to tell. And if you look at the sales catalogs, it instantly jumps off the page what horses you want to go to see, because there's a story, and it's performance rich. And as breeders, when you're looking for the show jumping market, whether you're, you're advertising uh, in, in the sale at the auction house or you're selling privately, that's what you need to be telling. And it, it can't be fictitious, it has to be fact. We're in a digital age. People can look it up on the internet now and, and find out if what you're saying is correct or not. Consider having a prefix, because again, as you get into your, your breeding program, the prefix as in, will be associated with your, your, your stable name and will again help attract buyers and also will aid you in tracking down horses that maybe have gone abroad and are competing that you're able to keep up to uh, how, they're, how they're doing. In my opinion, to be financially successful, you cannot afford not to have a digital presence. And what do I mean by that? A digital presence means that you are online in some shape or form, whether it be you have a picture of your horse, you have a video clip of your horse, you have your own website, you're on social media, but you cannot avoid being there if you want to get financial return because your competitors are on there. And if you go on the internet, there's how many horses for sale? The day of selling over the phone is no longer there. They want to see a video of your horse. They want to see a video clip. They want to see uh, what performance is there, and they can look it up. So therefore, you have to embrace that as a breeder. And you may do that through your own website. You may piggyback on a marketing website. You might through social media. Or, and it's the most important thing that your content is must be relevant and well presented. If you look at social media, Facebook would be the main form. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Facebook. Facebook has one billion active users. Other social networks have tried to take them on and failed. It is here to stay, for certainly for the foreseeable future. It is a fantastic tool, but it requires time and effort if you're looking at promoting your stock. And I suppose the first thing is, as a breeder or your stud farm, have a business page, which is separate to your personal page, where you can upload your information about your horses, have pictures, and you can interact with your fans, your followers, the industry. Change your banner regularly, because it will engage your, your, your followers, the people that click on and like your page, because that will come up on their, their, their stream. Share and post interesting information. It doesn't all have to be about your horses, but you might come across an article, uh, might be results at the weekend. If you share, again, it's keeping you out in the limelight when people go in and check their Facebook page. And again, that's subtly uh, marketing. It's important to have a marketing plan leading up to time for sale. There are certain individuals, uh, and some of them are here with us today, who are very good at marketing to digital, and particularly to the social media channels and YouTube, because they Look at when is the time of sale, and we drip feed out information leading up to that. So when the sun is shining, they're out taking good photographs of their mares and foals. When the foals are looking at their best, they've got summer coats, they're on good grass, they're looking well, they're strengthened up. They're putting together information of what siblings maybe are doing performance, they're researching uh, the marketplace, if the sire is doing performance or other projects are doing well, and they're filtering that information out to the social media channels and their own website if they have one. And again, that's generating interest in the marketplace, highlighting your product with a view to generating a better price. One thing I want to be mindful of with Facebook is, let's say, you know, somebody can come up, I've got a thousand followers, and when I post, should all those people see it? Unfortunately, no, they don't. Um, let's say where only 15 to 20% of the people see the post because they may not go into Facebook every day and they may not see those posts. So just be mindful of that. YouTube is free and easy to use. You only get one chance to grab people's attention. And unfortunately, too often I see on websites where the quality of the video clips and the pictures are far from desirable. And I'm not talking about the quality of, of, of the actual video. I'm talking about what's being shown. If you were going to buy a car in the morning and it was, hadn't been validated, it was still dirty, would you entertain the salesman with looking to ask you a decent price? No. You'll walk away and you'll walk into the next shop window. 
Same with your horse. And there's so much competition now on the, the digital that you have to stand out from the crowd. Again, just on the um, YouTube, it's important to have YouTube followers as well. Your own website, have your own website, important to regularly update information, effort required to generate traffic. A website only as good as the amount of traffic it gets. Um, and social media can aid in that process. Or else you can piggyback on a marketing website where you let them do all the work and you pay a fee to have your, your video clip up on it. Just I suppose, I don't want to leave you with, with all the negatives of the industry here. I want to just finish with talking about the American market and alternatives outside of Ireland where there's an opportunity for financial return. And I came across this study that was done by the US Equestrian Federation um, in America. And a few facts jumped off the page. One, females comprise 85% of the participants. 40% report an individual income in excess of $150,000 per year. The average rider has five horses and competes in 14 events. These riders are looking for 125, 1 meter m horses that can do it comfortably, that are athletic models, that are well produced, and can come out the weekends and be competitive. And I think aiming for the top end of the market, we can, we can filter through that. So when you think about our videos, it's important what we can include in that. So folks, just to finish up, the target market, if you look at show jumping, they, what, are that, what are they willing, what are they looking for? Your job is to produce a product, promote it to the marketplace with a view to getting the top price for your animal. Thank you very much for your attention.